Hello everyone, I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Today's chat is going to be about the horrors which took place at the Arthur G. Dozer School for Boys. Now it's very devastating and heartbreaking what happened to these children. And today we will be chatting about their story. So with that being said, let's chat. When the Arthur G. Dozier School for Boys was first organized under an act of legislature in 1897, it was not known as the Arthur G. Dozier School. It was actually called the Florida State Reform School. And operations began at the school on January the 1st, 1900. Now, the school was originally ran by five commissioners who were appointed by the governor. Now, the commissioners, they were replaced by the governor and the cabinet of Florida sometime later. And the name of the school was changed to the Florida Industrial School for Boys in 1914. The name of the school was changed again in 1957 to the Florida School for Boys. And the name was changed one last time in 1967 to the Archer, to, I'm sorry, to the Arthur G. Dozier School for Boys in honor of a former superintendent of the school. Now that we've went over some history about the school, let's get down to what we're really here for. Located west of Tallahassee on 1,400 acres of land, the Dozier School was intended to be a strict institute that would rehabilitate and help young delinquent boys get back on the right path. Now, the school, it housed boys who were said to be disobedient, thieves, and even the takers of lives themselves. Now, the school was supposed to reform the boys and eradicate them from their deviant behaviors so they could return to society as healthy and changed young men. But instead, the school was actually a house of horror and abuse for the children. No one could have imagined the horrors the children would face at the school. Now, you all, please bear with me. You know how YouTube censorship is, so I will have to use a few code words throughout the story. And hopefully, you all can chew bubble gum and walk or walk with me while I talk to you and be able to interpret what I'm saying when I try to use my little code words. But anyway, back to the story. Now, the horrors began at the school from nearly the beginning of the school's operation. And the school, it operated for 111 years in the small panhandle town of Mariana, Florida. Or it might be Marina, Florida. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Now, as we said earlier, operations began in 1900. Well, as early as three years after operations began in 1903, according to an inspection at the school, the children were commonly kept in leg irons. Now, the Dozer School, it really earned its reputation as a school of abuse, beatings, apes. Now, I'm not talking about the actual animal. Put an R at the beginning of the word, and that's what I'm actually referring to torture, and several students lost their lives at the hands of staff. And according to the reports, between 1903 and 1913, investigations discovered that some of the children were denied food, they were shackled in chains, as we said earlier, they were rented out as workers to people in the community, they were beaten, and they were even denied clothing. And some of the children who suffered this type of abuse were as young as five years old. Now, it's completely devastating what's happened to these babies, but let's keep on moving through the story. And according to the reports, students at the school, they were chained to the walls and beds and brutally beaten. Leg irons were used to torture and punish the students. There were also reports of there being a dungeon in the cellar of the dining hall where the children were abused in a sexual manner. Now, the children, they really weren't safe anywhere within the school or with anyone at the school, rather. The children were not even safe with the physician. 
Now, according to a former student of the school, the boys had to remove all of their clothing to receive vaccinations and physical examinations. And one boy, he was even grabbed inappropriately by a doctor during one of these encounters right in front of the other students. Now, you all are probably wondering the same thing that I was wondering. Where are the parents of these children and how could they get away with treating these children so badly? Well, many of the boys, they were orphans. And the ones who weren't orphans, their parents had no clue as to the torture their children were enduring. Now, their parents, they were not allowed to visit them. And if the children wrote any letters to send home, the staff made sure they did not contain anything bad about the school. And the system, they really turned a blind eye to what was happening to these boys. And according to the reports, the black students, they were treated the worst. They were even segregated from the other children until 1968. Now, also in 1968, Florida Governor Claude Kirk, he visited the school. And during his visit, he found overcrowded and poor conditions. Now, not only were the boys being abused, the infrastructure of the school, it was also crumbling to pieces. Now, the Florida governor, he stated, and I quote, somebody should have blown the whistle a long time ago. Yet, he did not blow the whistle himself, and the school remained open for several more years. However... Corporal punishment, it was banned at the school in 1968, which was the same year that the governor visited the school. But I'm like, what do you mean? I mean, corporal punishment is a form of physical punishment intended to cause pain. So why was it even allowed to begin with? I mean, I'm confused. But let's keep on going. Now, the governor, he was very broad about the conditions of the school when he told his accounts. So we're going to discuss what the actual survivors of the school had to say. Now, hundreds of survivors, they have come out to tell their story. And according to them, the walls of the school were stained with blood. There were bits of lip or tongue on their pillows and the facility reeked of urine and alcohol. Now, many of the survivors, they even remembered the horrible cries for mothers and Jesus, the sound of the bed springs with each lick they received during a beating, the grinding of the old fan that muffled their screams and cries, and the one-armed man swinging the leather strap. Now, the survivors, they even talk of a place that they were taken to receive some of their beatings called the White House. Now, Pastor Johnny Lee Gaddy, a survivor of the school and a member of the White House Boys, he shared his story with the world about his experience at the school and what happened to him at the White House. Now, the White House Boys, they're a group of more than 300 men who have come out to share their stories about the horror they face at the school. Now, Gaddy, he was 11 when he was sent to the school. Now, he was sent to the school for truancy. I mean, he would often skip school because he was picked on for stuttering. Now, Gaddy, he stayed at the school from 1957 to 1961. And according to Gaddy, late one night, the truant officer told his mother that he was taking Gaddy to see a judge for his truancy. Now, Gaddy, he was young, but he was not too young to know that this didn't quite sound right, especially considering how late at night it was. Now, Gaddy's mother, on the other hand, she was a very trusting, religious, and easygoing woman who really thought nothing about it. She actually told Gaddy not to run and to go with the truant officer. Now, Gaddy, he says that when he got to the destination with that truant officer, the officer put him in a booking cell and said he, would, he wanted him to sit there until the judge came back. Now, Gaddy says after he fell asleep in the cell, the officer returned to the cell and said, hey, boy, get up. And when Gaddy asked where the judge was, the officer said, Ninja, you're going to Morena. Now, I had to say Ninja, you know, as my cold word, because, of course, I can't say the actual word on YouTube, but you all know what I mean. But back to the story. Gaddy faced 
terrible abuse at the school. And let's chat a little bit more about his first experience at the White House. Now, one day during the excruciating work the boys had to complete, Gaddy, he saw a six-year-old boy pass out in the mud from the tiresome work. So Gaddy, he went over and picked the little boy up out of the mud. Now, Gaddy, he was accused of talking back when he was told to leave the boy in the mud. So he and the little boy were dragged to the White House. Now, the White House, it was a small building at the school where the children were abused, tortured, harmed in a sexual manner, beaten, and many even lost their lives there. Now, while at the White House, Gaddy was told to lie on the bed and grab the railing. Now, he was also told that he better not turn the railing loose and to look at the notch on the wall. Now, the man that was telling Gaddy all of this, he also let Gaddy know or he informed him that he can hit him below the belt or even in his life if he let go of the bed railing. Now, we all know a child getting a brutal beating across his head and body with a strap is going to be jumping and moving all over the place. I mean, come on. Hell, I'm an adult and I'll be climbing up the wall under the bed if I were in that situation. So, of course, Gaddy let go of the rail. And Gaddy stated that letting go of that rail was the worst thing he could have ever done. Now, when it was all over and said and done, Gaddy, he entered the school cafeteria with blood dripping from his head. And all the other students wanted to know was, did he hold the bed? Now, there are so many heartbreaking stories from these survivors. Let's keep going. Now, in 1890, I'm sorry, 1982, an inspection revealed that some boys at the school were hogtied and kept in isolation for weeks at a time. Yet the school remained open. Now, in 1985, it was revealed that the students were handcuffed and hung from the bars of their cells. In fact, the staff or the prison guards, as some of the reports call them, they actually stated that this was routine and approved by their supervisor. Yet the school remained open. Now, in April of 2007, many, many years after the school's operation began, Florida Department of Juvenile Justice Secretary, Mr. Walt McNeil, he fired the acting superintendent and an officer after an investigation into the abuse of the students. Yet the school remained open. Now, in 2008, the school was placed on conditional status because it scored poorly and it's on its annual inspection. And it failed its inspection the following year also. Now, investigators, they reported a large number of allegations of abuse and mistreatment they found. They were, I'm sorry, the investigators report it reported a large number of allegations of abuse and mistreatment. They found there was a lack of supervision and they also discovered staff was very untrained. Now, the superintendent at that time when all of this was going on, Ms. Mary Zahosky, she stepped down after the performance evaluation revealed the report's findings. Yet the school remained open. Now, in a 2010 report published by the U.S. Department of Justice, a survey's findings were revealed. And in that survey, 11.3 percent of boys stated that they had been subject to forced sexual misconduct by staff within 12 months. 10.3 percent reported they had been subject to the same type of abuse as well, but force was not used in their case. And 2.2% stated that they had suffered the same type of abuse as well, but their abuse was from other inmates. All of this was going on, yet the school remained open. Now, not only did the school remain open, the same year in 2010, the state announced plans to merge the school with the Jackson Juvenile Offender Center to create a single facility. Now, I know you probably are thinking the same thing I'm thinking, but before you throw your phone, I do want you all to know that the school was finally closed in June, well, on June the 30th of 2011, under claims of budgetary limitations. 
the Jackson Juvenile Offender Center, it was also closed on this day as well. Now, I want to go back just a little bit before we move forward. Now, December the 9th of 2008, Florida Governor Charlie Christ, he directed the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to investigate the allegations of homicide, torture, and abuse at the school. Now, the investigation, it lasts for 15 months, and hundreds of interviews were, conduct were conducted. But no bodies were exhumed, and they claimed nothing was found at the White House during the forensic examination. So, of course, nothing was done and no, one, no charges were filed. No one was charged or anything like that. But thankfully, the story of the White House boys piqued the interest of a forensic anthropologist. I'm sorry, anthropologist and associate professor at the University of South Florida, Miss Erin Kimarelli. Now, at this time, Kimarelli, she was leading a USF team of anthropologists, biologists, and archaeologists in exploring the Mariana campus. Now, Kimarelli, she questioned the fact that state prisoners, state hospitals, and other state facilities at that time, they actually kept impeccable airtight records as to where people were buried. But the school, they did not. So that was pretty puzzling to her. I mean, not only that, but other facilities records were so impeccable that it said that someone could walk up and ask, where's my great aunt buried? And they can show them the exact location. So the school's lack of burial records, it really stood out to Kimarelli. Now, Kimarelli and her team, they use ground penetrating radar technology and excavations to identify where bodies were buried near the school. And by December of 2012, they had indicated that 50 graves were on the grounds and a second cemetery was likely to exist. Now, however, they could not exhume or dig up the bodies to determine the cause of death. The bodies could only be exhumed at a family member's request. Now, miraculously, Mr. Glenn Vornado, the nephew of Thomas Vornado, he was a man who was sent to the school, Mr. Thomas. So his nephew, Glenn, he requested for his uncle's body to be exhumed so he could be buried within the family cemetery. Now, he had previously visited the school in the, in the 1990s and was shown where his uncle's body may have been buried by one of the staff members that was working there at that time. Now, what's interesting about this is that the location where he was shown his um where his uncle's body may have been buried was a completely different location from where the team believed they had discovered the 50 graves. And now when the state got wind of all of this commotion that was going on and everything, they tried to be slick. They tried to be slick and go ahead and hurry up and sell the property before they started, you know, exhuming graves and all of that stuff. But Mr. Varnado, he filed a suit and a judge issued an injunction against the sale of the property. Now, on August the 6th of 2013, Governor Rick Scott and the Florida cabinet issued a permit allowing the USF team to excavate and examine the remains of any and all boys at the Dozier site. And on August the 31st of 2013, the exhumations began. And according to the reports, as of June 2022, 55 unmarked burial sites have been discovered. Now, Kimmerell's, her book, it lists the names of 46 boys and young men that the team was able to identify. And at least 21 of the boys' remains were given to their families for reburial. But unfortunately, several graves that were discovered contained mixed remains of several different people. And this pretty much made identification impossible. In total, um, as of now um, or recently, 55 burial sites were found. But it's believed that the remaining or the remains amount to over 100 people who lost their lives to unnatural causes or homicide, according to the reports. Now, it's so sad and devastating what happened to these children at the school. I mean, they were babies and young men, and it's just very heartbreaking. I mean, and in my opinion, 
These babies were failed by so many people. Well, that brings us to the end of today's chat. And I mean, I want you all to tell me, what do you think about this story? Why do you think they allowed the school to remain open while knowing fully? I mean, it was so many inspection and investigations. So they they knew exactly what was going on and they knew fully about the abuse that was taking place. So why do you think this school continued to remain open for so many years? Please tell me your thoughts in the comments below. Please like the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. If you would like to support the channel, the information to support will be in the description of the video below. And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.